Okay, a question that I get from a ton of you is where do I start if I want to start a podcast? And I love when answers are simpler than we expect them to be. So I wanna tell you about a resource that's changed the game for us with our podcast, and that is Spotify for Podcasters. If you wanna start your own podcast, Spotify has a platform that makes it so, so, so easy. You upload your episodes and then Spotify actually distributes it everywhere onto all platforms and even helps you earn money so that it can be profitable for you and a blessing for you, your family, your people. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit your podcast literally from your phone or your computer. So if you don't have a fancy setup, it's okay. You can immediately get started today. Then again, you distribute it to Spotify and everywhere else that podcasts are available. You can also do video podcasts, which sounds like a dream to me. And when you want to take conversations with your people to the next level, you can do Q&A and polls, all sorts of fun things. You can earn money with ads and podcast subscriptions, or you can just get started using what you've got for the good of others and the glory of God. Check out Spotify for podcasters. I use it. I love it. I highly recommend it. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app. I have it on my phone, highly suggest, or go to spotify.com backslash podcasters to get started today. Hey friends, you're listening to the Go and Tell Gals podcast with Jess Connolly. Here, we like to equip and encourage women who run on mission. This podcast is for you if you are a mom working in an office, if you are a college student, if you are a doctor, whatever your profession, whatever your vocation, whatever your season of life, we believe God has given you gifts to use for the good of others and the glory of God. And we pray you leave this podcast feeling encouraged and ready to go. We're so glad you're here. All right, friends, it's Jess here with Hensley. Hello. And we are kicking off, well, we're not kicking off, we're in the thick of May and the thick of talking about mothers and Mother's Day. Last week, we talked about spiritual mothering. And I would say this is in the top, definitely the top three questions or topics that we get asked to speak about. And it's essentially just the idea of balancing motherhood and mission. We put out a lot of content about it, but we wanted to have a fresh conversation about it. And today I invited Hensley in to talk about it because we're in really different motherhood stages. Yeah. And so I feel like a lot of times I'm talking about balancing motherhood and mission. I'm in a really different stage. And so, hence, will you just introduce yourself? Obviously, everybody knows you're on Go and Tell Gals team, but talk about your motherhood. And I think the piece that I'm really curious for women to hear about today is like, is this what you thought it would look like? Mm. Did you think you'd be a mom in this stage. Just talk about all of that. I want to hear all of it. Yes, all the things. So I have a one-year-old and I'm 25. So in a lot of circles, that's a young mom. (laughs) (laughs) And it is the best. He is a dream. He is Mm. precious. He is the dream. Yeah, He really is. He changed everything in the best ways. But Yeah, it looks nothing like I thought it would look like. It looks completely different. I really thought I was going to be a stay-at-home mom. Mm -hmm. I always thought that growing up. That was kind of like I always wanted to be a mom and Mm -hmm. always like held it as the highest mission, the highest calling. Mm -hmm. And I just really thought that I would be home with him 24-7. Yeah. Um, And it's definitely looked different. I work, obviously. I'm on team Go and Tell Gals, but I feel like I'm in a pretty unique situation because I have some flexibility that I know is a privilege and that Mm -hmm. not everyone has. So I work about 25 hours a week and then I'm with my baby the other hours, but it's completely different than what I thought. I, after I had my son, I just had a huge revelation of my capacity. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really, I really wanted more and I really wanted more for him. I think just having him opened up my eyes to a lot of things. And that's what I say to 
pregnant mamas or new mamas or people who are thinking about having kids that everything changes, everything changes for the best, but just hold it with super open hands because it's most likely going to look differently than you planned or expected. Yeah. Before I kind of tell about my season, this is my first question because we get asked the question so much, it makes me want to pause and just look at all the women I know, especially the moms and say, do you feel balanced? Oh, <laughs> like, do you uh, are do you feel <laughs> unbalanced if this is a conversation yeah. we're having? I think both. Yeah, I think in some ways I feel more balanced than I ever have been Yeah, on a huge zoomed out level. But I would not say that my day to day life looks balanced or mm. equal or textbook in any way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it just makes you wonder when you're like, okay, if we're all asking this, Mm -hmm. what are we feeling? What's the like, what's the problem behind the question? So I'm really curious about that. Okay. We'll obviously get into a lot of this. Here's one thing I want to just affirm and say that, yeah, I saw in your life is you did, and you are not the only mom I know. I would say to some degree, I relate a lot to this. So for me, it was kind of a slow burn, but I feel like we've even had a few friends recently who I feel like have had their first it, it's like they see in color mm-hmm. in a new way that they're like, hold on, wait, now I actually really want to work right. in a new way. In a different way. Or yeah. I want to put my hand to something in a way that I didn't feel that way before, exactly. which I do think is so really interesting. Okay, for context, I'll tell you guys where I'm at. I am a mom. My kids are 15, 14, 13, and 9. And I did not see any of this coming. (laughs) I did not see myself having four kids. And I will also say, interestingly, from my perspective, I also didn't see myself working full time. Growing up, I was not a woman of vision. I did not necessarily want to have kids. It wasn't something I thought about. I think if you had really pressed me, I don't remember anyone ever asking me if I wanted to have kids. And so I think if you had really pressed me, I would have said like, yeah, maybe, I guess so, because it felt culturally right. But it wasn't something I thought about or dreamed about. I've never felt overly maternal. My husband and I would say maybe one, maybe two in 10 years. After being married for 10 years, we got pregnant eight months into marriage. And then we had three kids really close together. And so right after we had our first three, I had been in the workforce before I got pregnant. And I had been in in ministry to some degree. And what my story in particular looked like is I went through a bout of what I would call like pretty extreme postpartum depression. And I was like, well, that's it. I'm done. I'm not working at all. I'm not going to, I felt so defeated. So my decision, I went through a few years where I was solid, like I will not be in work and I will not be in ministry. None of it had to do with balance. All of it had to do with defeat. Mm -hmm. None of it had to do with desire and vision of like, I want to be this particular type of mom, all of it had to do with like, I just don't think I can do anything. I really remember assuming like, I'll never work again because I didn't think I had any hireable skills. And that's how I felt from maybe like 23 to 26, maybe 27 in there for me. And this is where a little bit of like, I would say I relate to you is our daughter, Glory, had a grand mal seizure when she was three and got diagnosed with a seizure disorder. And out of that, for me, a lot of fight and spiritual awakeness came to be. Interestingly, out of that, I started a print shop that turned into me working. But all that being said, about 10 years passed, about 10 years passed, and all of a sudden, I found myself and realized I was a working mom. And I was like, wait, hold on. What? What happened? (laughs) And so I think probably two or three years ago, it hit me that I was a working mom, whereas I had always just kind of thought probably around the time that Go and Tell Gals really kicked off that I realized like, oh, I'm a working mom now. This happened. And then Hensley heard me talk about this privately, even in the last year as we brought on more full-time employees and we started developing like company rules Mm -hmm. about days off. And I was like, oh, I'm like really a working mom now. And it's, so it's just been interesting. So a lot of my story hasn't been intentional. Like I didn't point there, but I didn't, it wasn't because I was like pointing at something else either. I didn't have a lot of vision where this was concerned. So I've had to kind of go along with it. But so that being said, I would say I don't necessarily feel balanced, (laughs) but it's because I never had a picture in mind of where I wanted to be to be able to say like, well, this is where I was supposed to land. Right. You know, 
And so it's there's but for me there's been a lot of looking at other people's lives, mm-hmm. which I think you know, this is like a principle of science. If you're trying to exercise balance in your body, you don't want to look to the left or the right because you're going to fall. And I think that's what's happened for me. Whenever I feel unbalanced, it's usually because I'm looking at someone who works a more traditional full-time life or isn't in full-time ministry. And so like has some more interesting margin. And I'm like, oh, you have like a weekend with your family? You have two full days un- uninterrupted. That's interesting. Or I'll look at someone, you know, who is a stay-at-home mom and think like, oh, that that looks beautiful. But I, all that being said, I'm just learning. I'm definitely not going to find balance looking at other people's lives. That's very true. Yeah. Okay. So here's my question behind the question also. What do you think we mean when we say, like, how do you balance it? What do you think we're asking? Like, what are we looking for when we say, like, how do we balance motherhood and mission, motherhood and work even Mm -hmm. specifically? What are we asking? I think first you just kind of have to pull back the curtain on that Mm -hmm. because, like you said, we are looking for balance based off of what we've seen yeah. and what we've experienced. So whether it was the way that we were raised or the way that yeah. our mothers were or the way that our friends are mothers or the Instagram, the mommy bloggers, all the things, I think yeah. first you have to really pull back the curtain and say, it doesn't look like the way that a lot of people perceive it and experiencing balance and not feeling like you're going to fall over is going to look different for every single person because yeah. their weights are different sizes mm. and their experience is different sizes and support systems are different. Yeah. It all, all looks so, so different. So exactly like you said, you have to pull back the curtain and just kind of look ahead and look up at you and what mm-hmm. you're carrying. Yeah, that's good. I think when I think about balance, which I will be honest, I don't think about it a lot anymore. And we'll cut to the chase and say, you may have heard us say this on the podcast. We definitely say it in coaching a good bit that we don't think in general, I go and tell girls that balance is like a 24 hour situation. <laughs> like I spend this appropriate amount of time doing work and I spend this appropriate amount of time doing mission and this appropriate amount of time doing kids or family. It's a lot more fluid. And I think just even saying that helps. But when I do think about balance, I think what I really want more than I want to feel balanced is I want to feel genuine. Mm. So literally today, this morning, today's like a really heavy, just all the things day for us. It's a heavy kid day. It's a heavy family day for us. It's a heavy work day. We've got a, like a lot of church stuff going on. And this morning I was journaling and talking to God about it. And I wrote my day out like hour by hour to God. And I said, like, I actually just want to feel like my real self showing up to all these places. I don't want to feel distracted Mm -hmm. and I don't want to feel fake. And I don't want to feel like I'm putting something on. I want to feel like I'm going with you into these things. And I think that for me, when I feel unbalanced or when I feel disingenuous, it's when I don't have time to do that. Now, here's my big asterisk. This is another thing we talk about a lot within coaching here is that I do think probably one of the most important things we need to even say about that is that everybody and every woman and every season has a different plate size and a different pace size or just pace in general. And so there have been seasons in my life where in my motherhood, I've had a really small plate about what I can handle outside of motherhood. And I've had like a really like slower or faster pace. And I think it really does help to stop qualifying your plate size or your pace. Like slow isn't good and fast isn't good. And small isn't good and big isn't good. Like it is what it is and it is what it is in that season, you know? Right, exactly. And I think I tell everyone this when I say I'm a working mom, and a stay-at-home mom, because I feel like I kind of touch a little bit of both. But I think above all of that, like, I am a mom, and I'm still me. I'm still a person. And so I think when you're talking about your plate size, and you're talking about seasons, and you're talking about all of those things, like, this is what God has for me right now. Yeah. And I don't want to squeeze the life out of it. Yeah. I don't want to hold it so tightly that I can't be open-handed on what he has next. Yeah. And so I think it's also understanding that your pace and your plate size 
will change. Yeah. That's so hard in motherhood to say for the better this will change and for the worse it will change. Because I found in every season of motherhood, whether it was like newborn or toddlers, I always wanted like, okay, well, I figured it out. This is going to be the thing. Mm -hmm. The next season was like, sometimes for the better, I felt like I had more capacity or I felt like I had more time, but I just didn't want it to change. Right. (laughs) Well, as soon as you get used to it, especially in the early years, with a baby, the past year, every six weeks it changes. It his literally naps does. change, his food changes, his personality is developing. Yeah. Everything changes in those early years. You really you really can't commit to a yeah. routine or a rhythm because you have to be adaptable. Okay. Woof. That's that's a good reminder. And it's a good reminder for like teenage moms too. And for you know, if you have a nine-year-old or you've just gotten into a carpool season or if you're an empty nester, like the great thing about seasons is they change. The horrible thing about seasons is they change. Exactly. Yeah. It's funny. Jeannie Stevens, a few weeks ago on the podcast, said this quote that I had just been thinking about for weeks. And she said, the crazy thing about the present is that it's the only place we can experience God. Mm. It's the only place we can experience the presence of God. And she said, you can't experience the presence of God in your past and you can't experience it in the future. You can only experience it right now. Mm. And I think about that when I think about balance and motherhood too. Like, right, I, the only place I can get God is right now and kind of saying like, what are you doing here? What are you up to here? What challenge are you preparing me for or bringing me through or equipping me for? Yeah, it's really interesting. Okay, well, I want to speak to this about plate size just because, again, we're talking about motherhood. And I was sharing some this with some gals last week about motherhood. And I was, I was kind of thinking about this idea of how the plate and the pace changes every season. And this is just what's been true for me in motherhood. I feel like newborn stage, no matter if it's my first or my third or my fourth, I don't have a lot of anything. <laughs> Yeah, Just personally, it. like yeah. brain wise, so I would also say the same was true for me for pregnancy. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel alive when I was pregnant. I didn't have ideas when I was pregnant. Like getting by was where God was at. Like God was in the surviving. And then that's definitely how I feel in newborn season as well. I had four C-sections. And so just even the like physicality of like getting over that was always a lot for me. But for me in my kids' toddler years, I would say like when they were arranged like two to three to eight or nine, so far in my motherhood, I think that is when I actually had the most energy for work. Mm. And when I look back on the amount of work I did in those days, I'm shocked. (laughs) I am like, wow, I was a hustler. But I think it was because they took a lot of my physical energy, but I had so much mental energy. And what's interesting about this season, which everybody told me would come, is this season of teenagers, is that they don't take a lot of my physical energy. Mine, again, are 9 to 15. And I could easily potentially make it through a day without touching a kid. Now I have three like heavy (laughs) physical touch kids, so they'll want a hug, but like, I don't have to feed anybody. I actually don't have to feed any of them. They can make all their own meals pretty much at this point. I don't have to like pick them up or change a diaper or like even hold them again, unless we're cuddling, but it's such a heavy mental season. Mm -hmm. It's been a lot harder for me to have margin to do like good, deep, wild work. And even for me, part of my job is travel. And I have to say to some degree, it was easier to travel when they were like three to nine. But now if I schedule something for this fall, I'm like, am I going to miss a homecoming? Yeah. Am I going to miss a first date? Am I going to miss, you know, I don't know. It just, it feels different. And so I just always like to share that. Where do you feel like your margin levels are right now? Wow. That, that is a really interesting question. I feel like I have pretty good mental margin. Like I have capacity to do a lot of deep work. Even the days that I'm home or working from home, my baby still naps. Yeah. And so when he's awake, he's nonstop. The second he started walking, it, it was, everything changed. So physically, I would say he definitely takes up a lot of my time and space and energy because I do have to prepare and feed all of his meals. Mm-hmm. He's not cleaning up his toys yet. He has diapers. We have to change diapers. We got to change clothes. We have to do all the things. So physically, I would say it is a lot, but I think because I am in such a physical stage of motherhood, I have so much creative energy and compassion. Mm-hmm. And so 
my deep work time, I feel like I can cram so much into that two hour nap Yeah, that I know I have this boundary of these two hours. And so I feel like that's when just my mind and my heart has space to open up and yeah. be creative and just use that part of my mind because he is, it is such a physical stage when yeah. he's little. I'll tell you what else you and I have talked about this privately, but I feel like this is like a really fruitful friendship season for you. Yeah. And so I would even just say that I feel like you have so much margin for really like a relational oh, yeah. capacity. Whereas I think I've told you, I've probably also said it on the podcast the beautiful thing about my kids getting older is they've become more like my friends. The hard thing about that is I feel like I have less relational capacity that like I have talked to them so much by 9 a.m. that I'm like, I don't know if I have the margin to check on all my friends right? because because I've used a lot of that <laughs> energy for sure, for sure. And that's really interesting. It is. It really is. And I think especially being a young mom, I was the first of a lot of my friends to have kids Yeah, that especially newborn, even pregnancy, I felt super isolated and I felt pretty alone. But it was something about that like one year mark yeah, where everything seemed to just kind of open up. Yeah. And I felt a lot of energy to be able to pour out again. Yeah. It was kind of like maybe my hormones are balanced again. Maybe, like, honestly. Maybe I'm feeling more like myself. Yeah. But I felt finally like I could take some of that yeah, the energy and pour it out on people and start cultivating and creating relationships again. Yeah. A lot of my mom friends are new friendship, but right now I can't imagine a life without them because yeah. my son doesn't really talk to me. We definitely don't converse. Right. Like right. He says like 10 words. So right. Right. those days that I'm with him all day, I love having a friend to go mm-hmm. on a walk with. And I think it does the same for them. I think especially moms with young kids that are home, like we've got to band together. Like you've got to have that human interaction, or at least I do. I have to have some of those conversations. hundred percent. Adult friendships. Yeah. Okay. So if we're putting down some pillars, not that we're giving advice, because I don't think either of us really feel qualified or eager to do that. (laughs) But if we were putting down some pillars, I would think, let's say number one is if you want balance, you can't look to the left or the right. You can't. You just can't. And number two is it just sounds really healthy to look at your season and say, what do I have to give in this season? And what do I maybe not have so much to give of right now? You know, and knowing like the best thing is that that's going to change. And the worst thing might be that that's going to change, right. you know. It's interesting as you're talking about it. I'm like, okay, well, I don't have a lot of relational capacity to give right now. I don't have a lot of time to give right now. I think what's been interesting for me about this season of motherhood is that what I do have a lot to give is going to sound, I don't know, maybe wacky, maybe not. I feel like I have a lot of prophetic hope because something about this nine to 15, like my kids are going through such wild stuff and they're facing like such a wild world that I'm like, oh, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Like everything's going to be fine. Like I can't not feel that way. And so I feel like I have a lot of like prophetic words over them, but like also over everyone where like maybe a little more faith than I had to have mm-hmm. when like one plus two equaled three in my parenting. Yeah. When it was like, well, if I just tell them no consistently and like move them away from the thing they're not supposed to touch, then they'll be okay. And now it's like, there is no equation yeah. that makes them okay. But I believe God is going to take care of his kids. I believe he loves us and has a good plan for us. So I do feel like I, interestingly, the more time I spend with them, the more time I look at everybody else and I'm like, we're going to be fine. God's going to take care of us. He's got a good plan. You know, yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. Okay. I want to talk about this real quick. You said it briefly when you were talking about your expectations and you said you had previously believed like motherhood was the highest calling. So I tried to actually even do a little research about why we started using this phrase, because I will say for most of my early 20s, I thought it came from the Bible. I thought there was something in the Bible that says like motherhood is your highest calling. I find some verses that I believe people have utilized as a like springboard, but it's not in there. Right. (laughs) Right. verbatim what do you think about that like how can we talk about this in a way that honors this beautiful calling and also honors every other beautiful calling yeah it's a hard one it's hard and I think a lot of times we correlate what we love the most with what we feel called to the most yeah and I think maybe that's part of it. I think tradition is part of it. Oh, yeah. I think 
it's thinking that I love, I love my son so much that he has to be my only calling Yeah. or because I love him and want to take care of him. Everything else is less than. Yeah. And I don't know if that's necessarily it. And I think the biggest thing that I've learned in the past year is that every single thing with womanhood and motherhood and working and being on mission as a woman is both and. Yeah. And so I think you can say like being a mother is my greatest honor, but you can also say, I really feel called to be a Bible teacher. Yeah. And you can also say, I love my kids more than anything in the entire world, but I'm really passionate about medicine and that's, yeah. that's where I use my energy. So I just, I don't know. I just think people get so hung up in ranking things Yeah, and saying that they can only be one thing. Yeah. And I would say as moms, it's both and you're, ev- you can be yeah. everything. You can be all the things that yeah. you're not limited because you're a mom. I would say if anything, in my experience, my worldview opened up. When yeah. I mom. Yeah. I think it goes back to, for me, like what we always talk about at Go and Tell Gals is like, if it's for the good of others and the glory of God, there is a piece of me that is like, go for it. Yeah. Like if, if it's for other people in the glory of God. Now, if what you're, if the thing you're going for keeps you from loving your kids well, that's a no brainer. Right. But I don't know that we, I think we always assume that it will, that our God given mission will be like a detriment to our kids. Yeah. And I don't think it has to be. I don't even think that has to be the narrative. This is a really vulnerable story, but only because it's embarrassing about me, not embarrassing, but just a little like convicting. But humbling. I was probably in my 20s and I was having a conversation with my mom and she was just talking about like this desire she had for a ministry and for something she believed God was going to call her to. Now, mind you, I was in this really defeated season where I felt like I will never have capacity outside of like the four walls of my home. And I didn't even really feel like I had the capacity for that. But I remember saying to her, like, aren't we enough? And I was an adult kid at this point, Mm. right? But I was like, aren't we enough? Like, aren't we enough? Like, why don't you, why do you want more than this? And I said, wouldn't that be enough if like all God ever called you to was just loving us? And like with so much love and humility, she looked at me and she was like, of course it would be enough. Like, of course you guys would be enough, a hundred percent. And she kind of left it at that. She didn't debate me. But I will tell you, a few years later, she brought it up, and she was not trying to make me feel bad. She was just saying, like, you know, that conversation was like a marking for me, and I was gutted. I was so embarrassed that I had said that to her because I knew for me it was out of a place of defeat. And what was interesting is that I was in a season of my life where I was realizing my mom is, like, absolutely my hero, and I So I said to her, I was like, I'm just so sorry I said that because I want to be so much more generous with you. Like you are so wise and you're such a good leader. It like breaks my heart that I would have thought in like my own defeat that you wanting to serve somebody else with what you had would take away from me. It never would have taken away from me, especially not in my 20s when I lived across the country. You know, like when I was raising my own family, it wouldn't have taken away from her gifting. And so now I try to be so much more generous with her, but I also try to remember that when I speak to other women, like, yes, you have a plate and you have a pace in every season. But I think sometimes the enemy just wants to tell us that utilizing one gifting will make you not utilize another, you know, or not shepherd another well. And yeah, I don't know. I just, that bums me out for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. That feels like a great moment for us to take a quick pause. We will be right back after this. Last summer, we invited you all into free girl summer. We launched Breaking Free from Body Shame, my newest book, into the world, and we got to tell thousands upon thousands of women that their bodies are good in Jesus' name. But guess what? We were just getting started. We've just launched the Breaking Free from Body Shame Bible study in a printed version. A few months ago, we launched a digital Bible study guide, and we heard from you all that you said, nope, we need a physical Bible study book that we can take, meet in our communities, and dive into this word together. 
together. And so we did it. We made a printed Bible study for you all. We also have the video Bible study. If you want the teaching in your groups with two people, three people, just by yourself or with a whole crew of women. You can get the Breaking Free from Body Shame Bible study and the video Bible study at jessconnelly.com. And we would love to see what it looks like for you to keep breaking free in Jesus' name, aided now by the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, the weapon that will help us take out body shame forever. Let's go. So... Yeah, picking up right after that break, I just wanted to touch a little bit on stay-at-home moms and stay-at-home motherhood and just what that means and what that can look like for different women in different seasons. And all I really wanted to say about that was that it also is enough to just want to be home with your kids. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful ministry, stewarding and shepherding your kids all day long. If that's the season that God has you in right now, I just want to encourage you and just say that we're on your team too, that motherhood is mission, no matter what it looks like in any season, any different season. If it's something that's temporary, if it is your dream to be home with your kids, if it's something that you don't really want to be doing, but that you're maybe in a season where that's where you have to be. I just want to encourage you and just say that God's still working in you. He's Mm. still using you and that it's enough. And it's literally changing the world. Like if we, if we, that's so wise. Hence, if we haven't said that clearly, like motherhood is mission. That's another reason why I would say we don't have to balance it. Motherhood is mission. It's right. We can like debunk this idea that it's the highest calling for any of our friends who are not yet mothers or who don't plan to be mothers, that your calling still matters. But but motherhood is mission. It's changing the world. And I just think it's time for us to kick Satan in the teeth about like, is one good or bad? Is one better or right. more? Oh. Not none. Like that is a tool of the enemy. Only the enemy of our souls would pit women against each other, like to make them feel insignificant about their calling. And so I want women to feel like they're calling to motherhood, to stay at home motherhood, to work it out of the home motherhood, to all combos, to inside mission, outside mission, to just believe like there's abundance here and there's freedom here and there's healing here. That's it. That's all. There's so much freedom. And Mm. I think we just have to stop striving in motherhood. I think that we can agree as women and agree as mothers that motherhood can look different from friend to friend and person to person and that we have to be each other's biggest cheerleaders and we get to be each other's biggest cheerleaders that we we don't need to be each other's critics but we need to be on each other's teams come on that's so good oh i love it i love it yeah let's don't play this game of like letting him get any of our hearts in this or any of our like relationships in this in jesus name so good Okay, we wanted to end with just sharing a few different strategic tips for the like, maybe so so we're not saying balancing, maybe like the managing or the, I don't know, the like handling of mission and motherhood. So I have a few that I want to share and then I'll let you take it. So my top one is that I have to say, I think it's something that we just often forget, but that is that I communicate my God-given mission to my kids. My God given mission, and they are, they're a part of it for me. But if they were like the sole mission for me, I would communicate that. I would say, like, listen, you guys are it for me. Yeah. Like I am I'm going after God here in our home. And and like speaking that over them. Like I'm raising world changers. Like, you know, that's my life plan right now. But also if for some reason, or if you're like me and your mission takes you outside of the house too, communicate to that to your kids. Invite them into it by just telling them, let me explain to you what mommy is doing and why that matters. And and not at all to say like it matters more than me being here, but why it also matters. I feel like you can laugh along at this and also attest to it probably more than anyone else I know. And that is that my other strategic tip is I take really too far. And that is like bring your kids with you. So there is not a lot of mission that I do that my kids aren't physically with me in some way, shape, or form. We have always said for us, when our kids are, when they don't, when they're tired of church, when they don't want to be there, when they don't want to go places with us, like that would be a game changing season for us. We would not let them, we would not want them to go anymore. But right now they still really want to. They do. To the point where today we're here at the office and they're here. 
<laughs> like right, right over there. Like across, physically across the hallway. <laughs> two out of four of my kids currently are at home and not in like a traditional school setting. And they're with me in the office. If you see a picture of me in the office, my kids are probably like six feet away and you just don't know it. And they travel with me. My daughter Glow travels with me a good bit. My oldest son walks to church on Sunday mornings before I even get here because he's here doing sound. And so I think a lot of times, and again, I want to emphasize, like I said early on in my parenting, I never want to burn my kids out on mission. So if they ever don't want to, they don't have to. That's the option. Like, And I actually love when they exercise desire to be able to say like, oh, today I want to sleep or like today I'd like to hang out with my friends. That's beautiful. That's great. But I think a lot of times we just forget we can invite them along, Mm -hmm. you know, but I love seeing you do this having like Roman at youth group. Oh yeah. He's he's (laughs) been at youth group every Sunday night since he was four weeks old. Yeah. And it's been the best. It's been the greatest and the teens love him and he loves them. Yeah. And it really has been, it's been such a beautiful thing. And my husband and I have just said that we're going to bring him as long as it makes sense for us to bring him. So yeah. he is approaching those years where it might not be as easy to keep him out yeah. later on a Sunday night, but for now it's working. And I feel like that's kind of my philosophy with most things with motherhood. Yeah. Is now it's working and we're going to yeah. do it as long as it is. Yeah. So good. So good. My next strategic tip is that I think it's really helpful to know what you cannot and will not give away in your motherhood. Yeah. Like know what is sacred for you. And this is going to be sacred for different people. So, I mean, I have friends who I have mom friends who are homeschoolers who are like, I could never, would never give away my kids education. And to that, I say like, oh, I really could. There are some really gifted teachers who I think could do a lot better job at teaching my kids than I could. That is one that I can personally give away. There are parts of my motherhood that I could never give away. I can give away cooking. I know a lot of moms who say like, I want to be the one to nourish my kids and get them, give them little treats. I'm always going to give them a snack after school. And I'm not the way God made me actually like something from a can or like a foil package <laughs> is a lot better situation sometimes for them. But there are parts again of my motherhood that like I cannot give away. And for me, I highly protect those areas, even to the point where like you won't see them on social media, you know, right. they're very protected and they're really sacred and they're just for us. And a nanny can't do them. And I would say to some degree, my husband can't do them. Like they're just for me. For me, that would be like deep talks before bed, little like coaching and encouragement sessions in the Mm -hmm. morning, because that's my gifting and that's what I can bring to the table of motherhood for them. And then my last strategic kind of tip for just like not necessarily balancing it from a worldly perspective, but just managing it and shepherding it all is I would say ask for help where you can and expect to go slower in your God-given mission. Like, so my outside mission goes a little bit slower, but sometimes my motherhood goes a little bit slower than I, than I would think. And I ask for help where I can. I ask for help with like, again, the mission outside of my house, but also inside. I'm not the only one cooking and cleaning. I'm not the only one doing the chores. I'm not the only one doing the encouragement. I ask you specifically for help in like leading and shepherding my kids as their youth leader. Like I do not have to be the sole source of life for them. And that's helped me a ton. Any for you in your season that would help? Yeah, I think a big strategic thing is I batch my days. Mm. And that looks like every week I do the same thing on the same day. But I have work days where I just work and I'm in the office. I have one day a week where I just work on church and ministry things and don't yeah. look at work things. And then I have two days blocked off where I'm home physically present with my son all day. So good. And that has changed everything. Organizing yeah. my work, church, mom, life balance. I have those days at the end of the week to wrap up the household chores and to spend one-on-one time with my son and Mm -hmm. not worry about a lot of other things. So yeah, that's a small practical thing that has drastically changed mission and motherhood for me is planning it out, planning it out strategically. Another thing is that it's okay to accept help. 
Mm-hmm. I think, especially early on in motherhood, it feels like you need to do it all. Yeah. And that you're the one that carried them and you're the one that's nourishing them and you're the one that needs to change all the diapers and you're the one that needs to rock them to sleep and you're the one that yeah. needs to be getting up with them and folding all of their clothes. And yeah. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But I think if there is help and there are people in your life that you trust, take it. So good. Say yes. It does not make you any less of a mom by asking for help. And you're still going to be your kid's favorite person. That's not going to change. Me having help and childcare a few days a week has not changed my relationship with my son. He doesn't look at me any differently. And having those days where I know that he's cared for and looked after makes the days and the time that I spend with him even sweeter because I can be completely present with him. Mm, I love it. So good. Okay. Well, this is Jess and Hen signing off. We're we're signing off. And we are so (laughs) proud of you. We believe your mission and your motherhood is beautiful. God is mighty in both of them and all of them. We love you. We're proud of you. We celebrate you. We see you. We're on your team. Amen. Amen. We love you guys. Thank you for listening to the Go and Tell Gals podcast. We're so grateful you're here. Listen, would you do us a favor? If this episode has blessed you in any way, shape, or form, would you leave a quick review wherever you listen to the podcast? It helps us. It helps other people find Go and Tell Gals. Also, if you want to, send a screenshot to a friend or post about it on social media. We would also love to hear from you. So head to our Instagram, Go and Tell Gals, shoot us a DM, send us a comment, or you can join our Facebook Facebook community by searching Go and Tell Gals. We would love to connect with you more. We are so proud of you. God is mighty in you. Let's go. Go.